Hello and welcome to Baiju's exam prep. Welcome to another episode of our knowledge series. In this series, we have been covering important static topics over the last few weeks that are relevant for both your prelims and mains. If you are benefiting from this initiative, do let us know by pressing the like button, share these videos with your fellow aspirants, and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Also, if you have missed out any of the previous videos under knowledge series, please go to our YouTube channel and look out for the master playlist which contains the entire set of videos under the knowledge series. So let's start with today's discussion. Today we're going to talk about a very, very important international organization, an international grouping called BRICS. BRICS is particularly relevant for your prelims and as well as for your mains. So in this session, the idea is to understand what is BRICS. We'll talk about the origins of this group. We'll discuss the objectives of BRICS. We'll also have a clear understanding of the major initiatives that BRICS has taken up. And we'll also discuss India's relevance at this grouping. We'll try to understand why BRICS is significant for India. So these are the topics that we aim to cover in this short and brief session. And at the end of it, you should be in a position to answer any question that might come in prelims or mains. So let's start with the discussion and first understand the origins of this group. See, the term BRICS is essentially an acronym. It's an acronym, you can expand it, and it stands for Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. These five major emerging economies, they have come together to form this grouping called the BRICS. The idea of this grouping goes all the way back to the year 2001, when British economist Jim O'Neill who was the then chairman of Goldman Sachs, which is a popular investment banking firm, he came out with a research paper. He spoke about the four emerging economies of the world, that is Brazil, Russia, India, and China. He said that these four emerging economies, they have the maximum potential in the coming decades. And they also have the potential to challenge the economic dominance of the Western countries. So this is what Jim O'Neill proposed. He said that these four economies, they have registered tremendous growth over the last few years and they hold the potential to dominate the global economy in the coming decades. So that is how the acronym BRIC was coined by Jim O'Neill. So South Africa was not a part of it. And this was neither an initiative of the governments of these countries. It was just an idea that was proposed by Jim O'Neill that he said, that these emerging economies have the maximum potential to dominate the global economy and they should coordinate and work together. In this decade, between 2000 and 2010, there would be several developments that would happen, especially after 2005, which would actually bring these countries together and push their governments to form this grouping based on the idea that was proposed by Jim O'Neill when he coined the acronym BRIC. See, the first major issue for these countries was that they wanted to push reforms at international institutions, at multilateral financial institutions, such as the World Bank and the IMF. Why? Because World Bank and IMF, as you know, they are multilateral institutions. These are the international financial institutions that we have. And they are largely dominated by the Western countries. For example, the World Bank is dominated by the United States and the IMF is dominated by the European Union. These Western countries have a dominant position at World Bank and IMF and they retain most of the voting rights. So even though India, China, Brazil, Russia, even though they registered phenomenal growth in the 1990s, they were never given an equitable position at these multilateral financial institutions. See, at one point, India was taking assistance from World Bank and IMF. But as India grew and as India exploded with regard to its economic growth, India started contributing to the IMF. We started contributing to the global financial order. So naturally, countries like India, China, they would expect a greater voting share so that they could also play a decisive role in deciding on key economic issues in pushing for global economic reforms. But this was not happening at World Bank and IMF because it was largely dominated by US and the European countries. 
So this was one factor which actually brought these four countries together. Brazil, Russia, India and China. They all felt the need to work together to push for reforms of World Bank and IMF. That was the first factor which actually brought these countries together and they started working on the idea of a grouping that would be the BRIC grouping. So in the year 2006, the foreign ministers of these countries, they met on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly meeting and this was the first time that BRIC concept was formalized. In 2006, the BRIC foreign ministers, they met and they gave a formal structure to this grouping. And then, in 2009, BRIC became a summit in itself. It became a, a formally established organization with summit level status and the first BRIC summit was held at Yekaterinburg in Russia. The reason why these countries finally came together and formed a summit level grouping is because of the 2008 economic recession. I am sure many of you would have heard about it. Many of you would have read about it. Back in 2007-2008, in the United States, there was a major economic crisis that was triggered due to the mismanagement of the economy. It's often referred to as the subprime crisis as well. This crisis began in the real estate industry and due to bad loans that were given out by American banks, due to poor regulation by American authorities and due to poor management of the financial system by World Bank and IMF, this crisis erupted in the United States and it dealt a severe blow to the global economy. The crisis that triggered in US, it had a global impact and the global economy went into a recession back in 2008. So this crisis was largely blamed on the mismanagement of American institutions and also the institutions dominated by the Western countries that is World Bank and IMF. This was the second trigger factor which brought these countries together and they gave it a more formal structure and they held the first BRIC summit in order to reform the global economic system. Kindly note down these points. The primary objective of BRICS was to reform the global economic system, reform the multilateral institutions like World Bank and IMF and to counter the domination of the Western countries with regard to managing the global economy. So the first summit was held at Yekaterinburg only between the BRIC nations. It was still the BRIC. South Africa was still not a part of it. It was only in 2010 that South Africa was also formally admitted into the grouping and it became the BRICS as we know this grouping today. So that is how the BRICS was born in 2010 with the addition of South Africa. Now what is so special about this grouping? See the BRICS is a very very significant grouping because these countries, they account for 42% of the global population. Together, they account for more than 3 billion people and their GDPs combined together stands at 23% of the global GDP. These countries have significant intra-trade as well amongst the members. For example, India, China, their bilateral trade volume is often, it's often more than $100 billion every year. So these countries, they have significant trade amongst themselves. And they also happen to be major traders at the global level, right? They constitute for a significant part of the global imports and exports and they account for 17% of the global trade. These countries are very large countries as well, like Russia, China, Brazil, India. These are all very large countries with regard to their geographical area. They account for nearly 26.6% of the global land area and they have around 13.2% of the voting rights at key institutions like IMF and World Bank. This is what makes BRICS such an important grouping and a very significant grouping. These countries have the potential to become the dominant economies of the coming decades and as a result, they are going to play a significant role at all major global financial institutions. So this is what pushed these emerging economies to come together and form this grouping. In 2012, the BRICS countries, they actually pledged $75 billion to the IMF in order to help the IMF provide assistance to other countries which might be facing a crisis in return for voting reforms at the IMF. Because as I mentioned earlier, both World Bank and IMF, they are dominated by the Western countries, that is by US and European Union. These countries have retained a large part of the voting share and 
the voting share for countries like India, China, Russia, it hasn't increased, even though we are contributing to these organizations. So to push for these reforms at IMF and World Bank, the BRICS countries decided in 2012 to contribute $75 billion to assist the IMF's lending program, but on a condition that IMF should be reformed. There should be voting reforms so that a greater voting share is given to countries of the BRICS grouping. But this didn't happen as the Western countries would never allow the dilution of their voting share. So this led the BRICS countries to go ahead and launch their own financial institutions. And this decision was taken at the Durban summit held in 2013. At the Durban summit, the BRICS countries decided to form their own parallel global financial institutions that could rival the World Bank and the IMF, which were dominated by the Western countries. Since they couldn't introduce the reforms they wanted, since Western countries were not willing to reform these institutions, the BRICS countries decided at the Durban summit to go ahead and set up their own parallel economic initiatives and launch new financial institutions that could rival the World Bank and the IMF. This is why the BRICS grouping is so important and the BRICS grouping has taken a couple of very, very important initiatives that you should know about. The most important initiative taken by BRICS countries is the establishment of the New Development Bank or the NDB. The decision to set up this bank was taken at the Fortaleza summit held in Brazil in 2014. This was held one year after the Durban summit. At the Durban summit, they had already decided to create parallel global financial institutions. That is to rival World Bank and IMF. So at the next year's summit at Fortaleza, the BRICS countries, they announced the establishment of their own lending institution, that is the NDB, which would rival the World Bank. As you know, World Bank provides assistance. It basically provides financial assistance in the form of loans to countries which are looking to take up infrastructure projects and socio-economic development projects. So to replicate the role of World Bank and to ensure that the BRICS countries could challenge the dominance of the Western countries, they created a parallel institution called the NDB, which would perform a very similar function to that of the World Bank. So this is how the NDB was born. And today, NDB has become a major global financial institution. Today, it is funding many, many projects. It's funding around 80 projects in the BRICS countries since the bank was established formally in 2015. Today, its loan portfolio, it stands at around $30 billion. It has given out $30 billion worth of loans, developmental loans, to the member countries of BRICS. So the main objective of this bank is to fund infrastructure projects, sustainable projects that could promote socio-economic growth amongst the BRICS countries. This is the main objective of NDB, and it has funded several projects in the last seven years across various sectors. The NDB is funding clean energy projects, including in India. It is providing financial assistance to projects in the sector of urban development, environmental efficiency, irrigation and water management, transport infrastructure, creation of social infrastructure in the BRICS countries, and it even provided assistance to BRICS countries during the COVID-19 pandemic. So this is what makes NDB a very significant institution because today it is able to challenge the position of the World Bank. The important facts you need to know about NDB is that it is headquartered at Shanghai in China and according to the bank's agreement, every member, every founding member, that is the BRICS countries, they will have equal voting powers. Please write down this point. The BRICS members who are the founding members of the bank, the five countries, they will have equal voting share and no country will have a veto at the NDB. It's not like the United Nations, where permanent members of UN Security Council, that is the P5, enjoy a veto. It's not like World Bank or IMF, where Western countries have a greater voting share, and hence they misuse the voting share to dominate these institutions. NDB is nothing like that. It's not like the UN, it's not like the World Bank or the IMF. It provides for equal voting rights for all the founding members and no country has been given a veto power. So all the five countries, they take decisions through consensus and every country has 
equal rights and equal powers at the NDB. So today this bank is funding several key projects amongst the member countries and the most important point to note is that the NDB is looking to expand its membership. Is that clear? It's a very, very important development. The NDB is looking to expand its membership. It wants to bring in more developing countries and emerging economies under it. So according to the bank's agreement, any member of the United Nations could apply for the bank's membership. Any country which is a member of the UN could be admitted into NDB. The only condition is that the founding members will have a 55% voting share. The minimum voting share the founding members will have is 55%. Understood? Even within this 55%, it will be equally distributed amongst the founding members. The rest 45% can be distributed to the new members who might be admitted into the NDB. So recently in the last one year, many new countries have joined NDB and it's a very big development because this provides an opportunity for the BRICS countries to lead the emerging economies of the world, to provide assistance to developing and underdeveloped countries of the world. So that is why expansion of NDB is considered to be a long-term goal, a long-term objective of the BRICS grouping. It will not only increase the portfolio of the NDB, but it will also increase the prominence of the BRICS grouping itself. In the last year, four countries have been admitted and please make a note of this. It's very, very important for prelims. In 2021, Bangladesh, United Arab Emirates, Egypt and Uruguay. These four countries have been admitted into NDB, into the New Development Bank. And they've joined the NDB as the new members and they've become eligible for financial support, financial assistance through the NDB. This is why it is a very significant development. So in prelims, UPSC could ask a question. Can NDB be expanded? Can new members join NDB? Right? The, the answer is definitely yes. New countries can be admitted. Any UN member can apply for membership. But the only condition is that the founding members will retain a minimum share of 55%. And even within that, the founding members will have equal voting rights and no country will have a veto. The new members who are admitted, they are given a slightly lower voting share as compared to the founding members. So through this expansion of NDB, it has become a major financial institution today. Along with establishing NDB, the BRICS has taken one more big initiative. That is the establishment of CRA, the Contingent Reserve Arrangement. The Contingent Reserve Arrangement was also launched at the Fortaleza Summit in 2014. It was part of the Fortaleza Declaration. The CRA is a rival of IMF. See, if NDB is the rival of World Bank, CRA is seen as the rival of IMF. I hope, what, I hope you know what IMF does. The IMF provides financial assistance to countries that are facing an emergency, a financial crisis. If a country is facing a forex crisis or if a country is facing a BOP crisis or a balance of payments crisis, that is when the IMF steps in and provides emergency assistance that based on certain conditions. For example, India witnessed one such crisis back in 1991. We faced a BOP crisis, a balance of payments crisis. So then we were forced to take assistance from IMF, but we had to fulfill few conditions that were laid down by the IMF, right? The IMF will ask the country to devalue their currency. The IMF will ask the country to open up their economy so that Western countries, Western companies will get a greater market share. So all these mandates given by IMF has to be followed by the countries that are taking the assistance. Now Sri Lanka, for example, which is going through a similar crisis, it is still hesitant to seek that support from IMF because IMF's support is conditional. It might compromise the economic sovereignty of developing nations and underdeveloped nations. Why? Because IMF is dominated by the Western countries. They would like to use IMF to gain more market access in other smaller countries. So to counter the IMF, the BRICS countries have set up a parallel arrangement called the CRA, the Contingent Reserve Arrangement, which will provide short-term liquidity support. It will provide any financial support needed during a crisis, during a Forex or BOP crisis, and it will provide for currency swap arrangements so that the financial stability of the member countries can be protected. 
So that is why the CRA is so important and the member countries have committed a capital of 100 billion dollars. They have started this arrangement with an initial capital of 100 billion dollars which is readily available to the member countries that is to the BRICS uh, countries and they can seek out this financial assistance without having to depend on the IMF. So they hope to expand this cooperation along with NDB and CRA. The BRICS countries are hoping to expand their cooperation, their initiatives so that BRICS will become the leader of South-South cooperation. See in international relations, the terms North and South, they don't refer just to the directions. When we say Global North, Global South, it refers to the developed world and the developing world respectively. Global North refers to the developed countries, the Western countries largely, industrialized nations. The Global South refers to the developing, underdeveloped nations. So when developing and underdeveloped nations, when they come together and when they start cooperating and when they start helping each other, that is referred to as South-South cooperation. For example, India and Brazil, right? Both are developing emerging economies. So if India-Brazil cooperate, that is an example of South-South cooperation. Or let's say if India provides assistance to small countries in Asia and Africa, that is another example of South-South cooperation. So today BRICS is emerging as a leader of South-South cooperation through initiatives like NDB, New Development Bank, and new members are being admitted so that better financial assistance can be given to smaller economies. Through CRA, BRICS countries are moving away from their dependency on IMF. In the future, maybe other countries might also be eligible for assistance through the CRA. So these economic initiatives of BRICS is what sets the grouping apart. Apart from this, the BRICS countries have also proposed many other major initiatives to, to create a parallel economic structure so that they can reduce their dependency on the Western countries. For example, they have discussed about the possibility of a BRICS reserve currency in order to reduce their dependency on the US dollar. As you know, the US dollar is the most preferred reserve currency today for all global trade to happen, global investments to happen. Right? It, it, it is all done through the dollar system. The dollar is the reserve currency of the world. So countries like Russia, China in particular, which have issues with the US, they want to move to a, a new reserve currency and they have proposed the idea of a BRICS reserve currency that could promote trade amongst the BRICS members without having to depend on the US dollar, the dollar dominated financial institutions and systems that are set up by Western countries. They even want to create a new payment system, the BRICS payment system that could rival the SWIFT payment system, which is dominated again by Western countries. I'm sure in the last few months, you would have heard about SWIFT, right? If you have ever carried out a wire transfer, if you have sent currency to another country, you would have made use of the SWIFT payment gateway. If you have read newspapers recently, especially after the Russia-Ukraine war began, you would have read that Russian banks are being taken off the SWIFT payment system, right? It's essentially a, a communication system through which banks work together and they enable foreign financial transactions to happen. So the SWIFT payment gateway is again dominated by European countries and US and other Western countries like Canada. So the BRICS countries, especially Russia in particular and even China, they want to move away from their dependency on SWIFT. So they have proposed a new BRICS payment system. They are even considering the idea of establishing a BRICS credit rating agency. Because most of the credit rating agencies that are there today, they are all again from the Western countries. You might have heard about popular credit rating agencies. For example, S&P, Standard & Poor, or Fitch, or Moody's. Right? These are the big three credit rating agencies of the world. They rate the loans, the financial instruments. They rate even sovereign credit instruments. So the credit rating they provide is very crucial to attract investments and to be eligible to borrow loans. According to Russia, even India and China, these Western credit rating agencies, they are not, they are not neutral. They are largely in favor of their respective Western governments. They are often misused to target emerging countries and developing economies. So they do have a vision to set up a parallel credit rating agency that could rival the Western dominated institutions. 
they also have proposed the idea of a submarine cable right see today most of the internet large part of the internet it is carried through submarine cables that is under the sea cables these are ofc cables which are laid under the seas and the oceans which connect different countries and different continents this is what makes up the backbone of the internet but the current submarine cables they are largely dominated again by western companies and western countries there is a risk of western surveillance by western intelligence agencies so brics countries have proposed the idea of setting up their own submarine cables so that they can ensure their data security and and strengthen their cyber security so these are some major initiatives that brics countries are working upon and that is what makes brics such an important grouping now you need to understand that brics is not just an economic grouping see until now i was just highlighting the economic initiatives yes that is true because brics is predominantly an economic grouping that has brought the four four emerging economies together if you look at the origins if you look at the reason why these countries came together it's very evident that they came together mainly for economic reasons to challenge the the western dominance of the global financial system right so brics is definitely a predominantly a economic grouping but today the brics has really diversified the brics has gone beyond its economic initiatives today the brics countries are collaborating even on strategic issues for example they were collaborating and discussing the issues in afghanistan issues issues in countries like syria yemen they would actively discuss the civil wars in syria and yemen they would discuss the situation in afghanistan especially after the take over by taliban they even collaborate and discuss security related issues such as counter terrorism even piracy and maritime security all these have emerged as areas of cooperation for the brics countries so today brics is no longer just an economic grouping it would be incorrect to say that today brics has really diversified into security and strategic issues they are collaborating with regard to ensuring their energy security as well they are looking at various other energy options especially clean and renewable energy options they are looking to collaborate in the field of climate change as well and more importantly they have launched cultural initiatives as well they are focusing on improving people to people relations and they want to boost trade amongst the brics countries now this is what makes brics such an important grouping for india because today brics is not just an economic grouping that is limited to few initiatives it has branched out it has diversified and today it has emerged as an important international institution right but however india's participation at the brics grouping creates many challenges and dilemmas for india for example just 3 days back the brics summit was hosted by china you might have read about this in newspapers right china hosted the virtual format of the brics summit and many important discussions have taken place on all the issues that we have already discussed but as india participated in the recent brics summit there has been a lot of criticism against india especially by us and western countries because india is part of the same platform where countries like russia and china have a major presence now in today's times this is a issue this is a major challenge and a dilemma for india because russia has triggered a war in europe it has caused chaos across the world it has disrupted the global economy and caused massive human rights violations in ukraine right russia is being targeted by us and the western countries and european countries for its aggressive activities in europe us and russia they have a rivalry going on a new cold war has already begun between these major powers similarly us and china have intense rivalry going on between them in every domain in the strategic domain in the defense domain in the economic domain so for the us russia and china are hostile countries they have covert wars going on against each other us has targeted russia and china similarly russia and china have targeted the us and american interests so there is an active rivalry between them a cold war in fact is going on between them and this is what creates a complexity for india because on one hand we ourselves are a victim of chinese aggression right 
So this is where BRICS can become ineffective as a group. This is the challenge faced by BRICS. Because in the recent years, China has stepped up its tensions with India. It has aggravated the border disputes and it has gone to the extent of challenging India's sovereignty. It has compromised India's sovereignty in the Ladakh sector in the last two years. So India on one hand is concerned about China's aggression, China's intentions. India is at the same time caught in between the Western countries and Russia and China as a result of the Russia-Ukraine war. And this is what creates a dilemma and a complex situation for India. On one hand, we are part of the Quad grouping led by US and the Western countries. At the same time, we are part of BRICS as well, which includes Russia and China. So this is a dilemma for India. It's a diplomatic balancing act that India has to carry out. Few experts criticize India for this. They say that India is not decisive. India tries to be everywhere. It tries to be friends with everyone and compromises its interests. But however, that is just one argument. The other argument is that this is India's independent foreign policy at display. In fact, India has done quite a decent job at balancing these competing interests. See, Indian foreign policy is rooted on the principle of strategic autonomy, right? We are not allies of anyone. We are not allies of the US. We are not allies of Russia. We are good friends of every country which seeks out friendly relations with us. So that is what India has believed in. We have never joined any military alliances and relations with US should not come at the cost of our ties with Russia. That is what India believes. Ties with China shouldn't be at the cost of our ties with US, right? So India, yes, it is a contradiction. We are part of Quad, we are part of BRICS as well. We have close ties with US, we have close ties with Russia as well. Even though it seems like a contradiction, this is the success of India's foreign policy as well. That is the other viewpoint. Because this is our independent foreign policy at display that benefits Indian national interests, right? So no matter what criticism comes for India, because of its interaction with Russia and China at BRICS, right? India still engages very actively with BRICS grouping. Parallelly, we engage actively with the Quad grouping as well. So that is the beauty of Indian foreign policy. So today, Russia and China in particular, which have been isolated and cornered, they are looking to expand BRICS. They are looking to bring new members to the group so that they can increase their global prominence. They can get more global recognition and counter the Western sanctions by getting more members under BRICS. So they're actively pushing for expansion of the BRICS grouping itself. So this again creates a challenge for India, but as of now, India is playing the middle ground, right? We are backing the expansion, but we are a little cautious about it. But when it comes to balancing the Western interests and our interests with Russia, China, India is again playing the middle ground. We are playing this balancing act, which is a direct result of our independent foreign policy. So even though it's a difficult choice for India, even though it leads to criticism sometimes, this, is seem, this seems to be the right option for India as it helps us get the best of both the worlds, right? Foreign policy at the end of the day, it is designed to serve the country's national interests. So that is what India is doing and that is why BRICS is a very, very important group for India. So on this note, I would like to conclude the session. So let's see if there are any questions. I'll try to answer all your doubts before we close this session. First question, sir, who is the chairman of BRICS? See, the chair position of BRICS is held on the basis of rotation. Every country gets to hold the BRICS chair position one year after the other. For now, it is China because China recently hosted the summit. Next, sir, only Asian countries form BRICS. No, definitely no. It's only India, China, which are the Asian countries that are part of BRICS. But you, you also have Brazil and South Africa. So definitely no. There are countries from different continents. Next, when we compare BRICS with BIMSTEC, how relevant it is currently being that Russia is at war with Ukraine and China poses a threat to India. That is exactly what we discussed just a few minutes back, right? BRICS is a major platform for India to raise its profile, to push for global economic reforms. At the same time, it does create challenges because of the Russia-Ukraine war, because of China's aggression against us. But despite that, we are looking to keep those issues aside and we are looking to collaborate at the BRICS platform because it does provide many more advantages to India. Yes, China is creating problems for us in our bilateral relations. So India has decided to deal with the border dispute bilaterally, to deal with China's aggression bilaterally. Parallelly, we will work with China at the BRICS because it will help us to push for global economic reforms. 
Next, sir, what is IMF? IMF is a global financial institution. The International Monetary Fund provides for emergency financial assistance. Next, sir, new countries are joining members of BRICS. What will be the impact of it? See, new countries have not joined BRICS as of now. New countries have been admitted into NDB, into New Development Bank. Both are different. NDB is a bank created by BRICS, right? So new members have been admitted to the NDB, not to BRICS. But there is a proposal to expand the BRICS membership, right? So this will definitely have an impact because this might, this might dilute the powers that we currently have at NDB and other institutions. Or it might actually help us lead other developing countries. So there are both pros and cons of expansion of the BRICS grouping. Next, how is the NDB financed? NDB is financed with the member countries. All the countries, India, China, Russia, Brazil and South Africa, they contribute to the NDB. Sir, why US is not part of BRICS? There is no way US can be part of BRICS. BRICS was set up to counter the Western dominance of World Bank and IMF. So why will US join the grouping? Sir, what are the geopolitical, geoeconomic benefits for India from BRICS? I think I just discussed that in the session. So given the strain in India-China relations, how far the initiative of BRICS like submarine cable can hold water? That's exactly what I was pointing out. The tensions we have with China, especially in the defense and security domain, creates challenges at BRICS. Because there are limits to what we can do with China, right? For example, as you pointed out, the submarine cable initiative, it may not really take off because today China is the biggest cyber security threat for India, right? China is actively engaging in cyber espionage and cyber wars against India. So in that context, an initiative like submarine cable of the BRICS will not really succeed. So that, that is what is a challenge for the BRICS grouping, right? Internally, the countries are divided. They have their own bilateral issues. So this is affecting the, the role and the prominence of BRICS. Okay. So this is it. This is the last question. I think I've answered all of them. So I hope it was a fruitful session. Do let us know how it went. Like these videos, share them with your fellow aspirants and don't forget to subscribe to our channel. Afternoon at 3 p.m. we have another session. I'll be discussing the important Kyoto Protocol and do attend the session to understand everything about the Kyoto Protocol. So that is it for now. Thanks for watching. Have a good day.